It is really important that we have to think about our clients in that perspective of like, exactly like you're saying, what are the benefits to them, right? Yeah. Where are they going to achieve? What is the transformation and how can you guide them there? But they're the hero of the story. They Not are you. 100% the hero and you just have to be there to like say, hey, I can, I can help you get there. Uh, you're more likely to achieve it. It's going to take less effort and you're going to experience this dream outcome. If you can do those three things and convince people that those three things are going to happen, then you're not going to have problems getting people to pay you for your services or realize the value of what you do. Because I think PTs offer tremendous value and we just don't always show it and we're not always willing to talk about it. We share smart physical therapy conversations so busy PTs can feel connected to their profession. Welcome to the show. I want to say thanks to Physiotech. This is a topic that came up a while ago, remote therapeutic monitoring. I mean, the idea, or at least the proliferation of the idea, popped up during a little bit of COVID, right? Remote therapeutic monitoring uh, can improve patient outcomes, reduce provider, provider frustrations, imp improve clinic revenue. It might feel intimidating though. How do I get started? Is it complicated? Where do I begin to learn this thing? Well, you can get started simply with Physiotech. Find them online at physiotec.ca. That's physiotech.ca. And MW Therapy. They deliver modern all-in-one outpatient PT EMR with the built-in patient portal, marketing automation, and billing features you want and a great value. mwtherapy.com, where switching your EMR is easy. Excited about today's episode because it merges together a bunch of things that um, I like to get geeky about. Number one's running. I am a runner, or I used to be anyway. I mean, are we always? I don't know. Maybe I'm a runner. I'm not sure if that's a thing. Uh, it mixes together running, physical therapy, analysis, some technology, some communication skills, some learning. And it was just a really, really good conversation. So I'm excited to share that because, I don't know, I kind of live for a good conversation. Uh, Doug created run DNA and summing up what run DNA is would be hard but what I guess it probably is at its core is it's helping a, a running nerd a self-proclaimed running nerd like Doug help other people like physical therapists like you help other people breaks it down to a system it's evidence-based a little bit of technology mixed in but ultimately, it's teaching good people how to do good things to help other good people. So excited to get into this conversation with Doug. I think you can you can feel his enthusiasm, his excitement for doing this. And it really is a cool example of you can create this niche. You, talking to the audience right now, you can create this niche, whatever your niche would actually be. Get excited. So even if running isn't your thing, even if that's not your niche as a physical therapist, Look at what he did and how he did it. And you can apply pretty much all these lessons to any aspect of a, of a career. He focuses on that too, is, is create this niche because when you aim small, you miss small. That's from The Patriot. It's one of my favorite movies. Uh, so uh, Doug from Run DNA on the podcast right now. Uh, Doug Adams on the show. Doug, welcome to the program, man. Hey, Jimmy. Thanks so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Uh, Doug, what's your, I ask this of, of people, uh, sometimes what's your superhero backstory? I like saying it like that instead of like, Hey, what's your resume or like, cause nobody wants that, but like, what's your, what's your superhero, like kind of PT evolution backstory, you know, that, that got you to this point? Well, that's a great way to put it. Um, I am a self-proclaimed giant running nerd and that has been my superpower kind of along the way here starting uh i have that typical story of i had a lot of injuries in high school and had a cross country coach that would just uh drive a certain distance and say run until you see my car he would sit and smoke in his car and we'd turn around when we got to his car <laughs> so surprisingly i got a bunch of injuries in high school uh but it led me to do like a senior paper on i started doing triathlons in high school uh, led me to do a bunch of senior paper because I had been, spent a bunch of time in PT, uh, rehabbing my own running injuries, and then went to University of Delaware, got really lucky with some great mentors there, Irene Davis, Rich Willie, Lynn snyder yeah. Mackler. Um, you know, we did gait analysis together when I was a student, when I was a resident, after my residency, did some research together with them. 
had a chance to really get access to some of the top minds in the world and be the lackey that was writing up the reports and, and doing that stuff, but uh, really learning as much as I could from them. And then when I, because I had that taste of academia, when I got into the clinical setting, I really missed a lot of those tools and resources. So that's when I like, I always say I teach a lot of courses and I've, I've taught, we just passed over 10,000 people that have taken some of our education. We're really thrilled about that. And I always say I'm like medium smart. Like I'm, I'm enough that I can understand the research and right. I kind of knew that, but I'm, I'm dumb enough that I need to simplify it and put it in a, in a very systematic approach that makes it really easy for me to do. Right. Um, and, a little bit, uh, I like to be comprehensive with these things. So I try to have the system do everything. So that's really where we started teaching courses in about 2012, 2013, started teaching a lot of courses on how to work with runners. And we developed and it turned into what we now call our certified running gate analyst courses and just continued on there. Um, and then being in a clinical setting, I didn't have access to the technology. So I looked up a camera system and didn't have $500,000 for a camera system. Yeah, at they're the not time. cheap. No. So I just decided to build my own uh, and built my own and then started using that. And then the military found out about it and they were using it a bunch. And then we started using a bunch of PT clinics. And so now I'm just a giant running nerd that gets to spend all day either treating runners in my cash-based PT practice in Wilmington, Delaware, uh, or helping others treat runners across the globe now, which is uh, a lot of fun. So I've, I've just giant running nerd. There's a lot to unpack there because I love story, right? My lens is communication and PT, but I can't not look through this lens of communication, right? So I'm, a, I'm just going to throw out things that stood out at me. Number one, you started and ended with the same phrase, which is cool because it's like you didn't, how you were doing what you were doing changed, but who you were didn't. So there's your driving force through the whole thing. It's like, I'm just a big running nerd, which is really cool. Uh, you, you mentioned like two names of, I don't know, like if you had the Mount Rushmore of like running physical therapy, like there's, I don't even know who else you'd put on, right? Irene Davis and Rich Willie, like that's pretty legit. And you oh, got yeah. to hang out with them, like just hang out there and just- Definitely explore, some hula. Right? right? Some timing and some who luck there that they just all aligned. Um, and I just got a chance to really pick their brains and, and learn as much as I could. And um, that's actually one of the advice I give a lot of PT uh, students or aspiring PT students is always look at the university, what the faculty are doing for research. And if you're not interested in their research, then you're not going to learn as much from that person yeah. as you potentially would. Like, why'd you learn why do you think you learned so much about running? It's not comp. You liked it. You were interested in it. You had drive there. There was curiosity. Right. I, I already knew that personally, I liked running and I liked the community. I like working with runners. I mean, one of the things I love about runners is that they self-identify as runners. Oh, yeah. It's like I play basketball or I am a runner. It, right. It's this great community. And for me, working with a population that is motivating, that I enjoy, is a big, uh, it's a must have, actually. I, I can't, I need to work with people that appreciate, I'm going to put so much time and effort into your treatment. If you don't appreciate what I'm doing, yeah. and if you're not willing to do it, then I'm not going to pour my life and soul into getting you better, which, it, which is the only way I really want to treat. Yeah, so... We're, I'm not even done unpacking your your superhero backstory either. But what you just said was um, sort of like it's like a business communications life psychology lesson, which is we're often taught. And we talked about this just briefly before we hit record, which is I think co conventional wisdom would be everybody's your ideal customer or like make them bend and shape yourself so you can help everybody when the opposite is true, you know. If you're trying, if you, and, and, and there's a lot of pressure opening a business or becoming a physical therapist, right? Identifying as a physical therapist. I want to help as many people as I can. So I'm going to keep working to get to the yes. And I forget the author's name, but the, the author that I'm talking about that I'm sure the author uh, the audience will now correct me in the comments because that's what happens when I forget is 
maybe you should try to get to the no or to try to find out why that person isn't a great fit as fast as possible because the next person might be a great fit and a fit for both of you. And when it's a fit for both of you, how you're describing, great stuff happens. Absolutely. Yeah. Understanding your ideal customer. We teach this in a course that we, for our technology users, um, we provide marketing and business development support and we have a worksheet that they go through. And when they're looking at it, they have to identify who their ideal customer is. And you need to get granular with this. You need to understand who that person is. What are their demographics? Where do they spend their time? What kind of things excite them? What are their objections to your services? And what are the things that are going to limit them from seeing you so that you can really speak to that audience even better? And I think even like with that, too, I think it starts with understanding a little bit of your why. Oh, very much. A little bit of like, why are you doing this? Uh, Before you can understand that person that's going to be your best customer, it's like, why do you do what you do? Right. I I was like 23 years old and my boss, Chris Lloyd, at like the radio station I spent the most time at was like, today we're going to do an exercise where we're going to design our ideal listener. And at a radio station, like that can be broad, right? Um, But I can still, I can picture Keith. Keith was the person we gave a name to. We knew his wife. He had two kids. He went to high school in that area, left for college, but came back. We knew how much he made. Like, and I was like, this is like, this is goofy and dumb and cute. But we, we would pass in the hallway and my boss would be like, Hey, there's a chance that we do this, this, this with this company as a promotion. Like, what do you think? And literally we'd just be like, I don't know, man. Do you think Keith would think that's cool? Like we literally started talking about them like that. And it let us say, it's almost cool, but what if you change this? I think Keith would like that more. And it made it easier because, as you said before, again, still still unpacking uh, Doug's backstory, which is you said you're medium smart, but you like to simplify things. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Making Einstein said that if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it. So understanding it enough and being able to communicate it, even if it's to yourself first, that's a, that's a, that's a skill. That's a, that's a skill. Yeah, that um, that's I uh, I really enjoy breaking things down. That is like taking complex, breaking it down into the next steps. Because I think as clinicians, that's what we really need to do, and that's what a lot of people are intimidated about running gate. I think I I think that people are afraid to address gate with somebody because they look at somebody and like, well, their arms are flailing, their knees are collapsing in, their toes are pointed out. All these things are happening. Like, I don't even know where to start and I want to mess them up. But really there's unintended benefits that if you focus and prioritize on the right thing, a lot of those other things are going to fall in line. And it doesn't have to be complex. Like this one, we, we talked a little bit before, we're not going to give any P values or anything, but like right. I, I love a lot of the, the running literature, but one of my favorite articles, uh, I think it was Stuart Warden, JOSPT 2021. If you reduce the stress of each step with running by 10%, you can run twice as far. Wow. So See, that's, a, that's a statistic that someone can wrap their head around. That is something that we as clinicians, when we always hear in school, like you got to stay up in the literature, you got to read this one, right? I'm more than a few years out of PT school. I still read all the articles and things like that. And I, that is something that's it's so important to be able to synthesize that data and convey to your patient, how does this relate to you, right? Because even when we're talking about that ideal customer, and we think about their objections, right? So my, some of my ideal customers, they've done multiple races within the past three months and they've got multiple races in the next three months, right? They're racing all the time. They're doing that. I know that they're into it, right? So that person might be afraid that they don't have time to change their gait or right. that they have to be too perfect with it or I'll never have perfect running form. So why should I even start in the beginning? So giving a statistic, like you only need to improve at 10%. 10% is nothing. Right. That's why there's a good bit of literature on, I think one of the most common things people think of with gait analysis is cadence manipulation. And we see that 10% with that is, is pretty achievable. Now, I, I will challenge people that there's a lot, 
a lot better ways to get people uh, to, it's a great way to start with Cadence, but there, there's a lot of other ways that we can personalize that and individualize it that will actually help much more significantly. I see Cadence work about one in five or so about 20% of the time. Uh, Cadence actually does the change that we want it to do, but, but simplifying it and saying, hey, just try this out. Does that feel 10% better? Great. You can run twice as far before your body breaks down. Wow. That's so achievable and obtainable. You just have to know how to get the right cue for the right person so that they realize that 10%. Yeah, but that's that's breaking down something into digestible parts using language they can understand. You know, you don't want to, you know, what we, we joked about p-values being, you know, complicated, but yeah. being able to simplify it so I understand it. And suddenly this, I suddenly, suddenly eating this elephant doesn't seem so impossible. So yeah, I'm willing... Because we know if you're not going to buy in, this isn't going to happen. Right. So if I'm like, listen, we don't have to go the whole way, but we're going to do this first thing. And I see we, we can see a lot of really great results. So if we reduce this by 10 percent, you can go twice as long. Like, OK, so I understand the in and I see the benefit, not the yes. feature. And I've had conversations with people a lot. And like the 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 win for me is when people are like, I just thought you were, you know, playing with words, features and benefits. And I'm like the the feature would be chain, you know, you know, changing the gate, right? That's the, the feature. Yep. The che feature is like reduction, reduction in, in impact, whatever but the benefits I can run longer. Right. So you knew that because you thought about your ideal person and said, what do they really want here? They want to run more. They want to feel like more of a runner. I don't feel like a runner this year because last year I was running twice as much and now I'm running half as much and I feel twice yeah. as bad. Great. Say the quiet thing out loud. But look at infomercials. They yeah. do a great job of repeating all of their ideal customers' problems. It's not fear-mongering. It's saying the thing that they're thinking out loud. And then the person hearing it goes, oh, okay, you get my problem. I don't know if you can solve it yet, but you at least get it. I'll lean in and I'll listen a little longer. And if you keep talking that way, they'll follow you. Right. It's um, have you ever read any of Donald Miller's books? Oh, Story Brand. Yeah, yeah, Story Brand. Right. So talking about the transformation that your customer will go through. So, you know, some of the things when we first started looking at some of the Story Brand stuff was like go from injured and frustrated to first place and and fantastic kind of right. thing or uh, PR, finish line yes exactly like thinking about that and it is really important that we have to think about our clients in that perspective of like exactly like you're saying what are the benefits to them right yeah where are they going to achieve what is the transformation and how can you guide them there but they're the hero of the story they Not are 100 percent the hero, and you just have to be there to like say hey i can i can help you get there uh, you're more likely to achieve it. It's going to take less effort and you're going to experience this dream outcome. If you can do those three things and convince people that those three things are going to happen, then you're not going to have problems getting people to pay you for your services or realize the value of what you do. Because I think PTs offer tremendous value and we just don't always show it and we're not always willing to talk about it. It's a little shift, right? I mean, we yeah. worked on with this podcast, we worked on our XYZ statement, right? One mm -hmm. statement that says we do X so that Y can do or become Z. And yeah. I always tell people when I'm working with them on this, it's simple, but not easy because you're trying to encapsulate a lot. And a lot of times it's easier to write someone else's XYZ statement if you barely know them than it is your own because it's like you have the curse of knowledge. You know so much. Well, I can do this and this and this. I'm like, you're telling me how you do things, not what you do. Yes. So even, I mean, our XYZ statement using sort of Donald Miller story brand has changed. And right now it's, we share great physical therapy conversations. So busy PTs can feel connected to their profession. Because we heard over and over again, once I graduate from PT school, we go out and then I'm in the clinic and I'm so busy, I can't pay attention to literature, just learn new things. And I, and I was like, and I like reduced the fraction. I was like, what's the emotion at the bottom of that? Like they feel busy and they lack connection. I was like, well, I feel like conversations, you know, over a beer, or over a coffee, like it'll do that. So I'm like, that's what we do. Cause like, I'll even point out, we didn't say podcast in that X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. We said conversations. Podcasting yeah. is how conversations is what. So this might all seem like, well, of course, Jimmy loves talking about it. This is background. I'm like, I think this could be the thing for most PTs. And I feel like you guys doesn't make any sense for for Doug to study story brand from Donald Miller, but it makes complete sense 
because you already know you're good at the thing. How do you make sure they understand that you're the, you could be a good uh, a choice for them? Yeah. And that goes back to your origin story about how this whole thing started, uh, that that's, conversation. And that's, that's, why, that's why people go to the conferences and it's connected. And we've even for our like live courses. So we we went through the whole thing during um, COVID where everything was live and then we went all online. Uh -huh. And it actually was great because that helped us get to those 10,000 people that have taken our courses significantly faster. Right. I, if we were doing all live, it would be much harder for me sure. to say that number right now. Um, uh, but so coming out of COVID, I went to, I'm going to butcher, so somebody can correct me in the comments. It's like AMSC, the sports section did this conference in Indianapolis. And I want to say it was maybe, I don't know if it was 2021, I think or so. Um, but it was a great event. And the reason it was such a great event is that they just built it around community. They spent so much time around like, hey, go to dinner, sign up to go to dinner with people you don't know. And you would sign up. And they would put you in these yeah, groups yeah. and you go to dinner with this group. And it wasn't like you paid for your own dinner. It wasn't part of the conference, but it was just facilitated. Prompted. Connection. Yeah. And so we, all of our live courses, we completely changed the format. We, we didn't go back to doing like, I don't, and I don't think people need to do this. I mean, there's some exceptions, right? If you're learning to do dry needling or something like, obviously you need some content, you need some, some hands-on type thing, but I don't think we need to be looking at PowerPoint slides when we attend a course. Preach. Right? We, when you're in live in person with it, it's a chance to engage with the instructors. It's a it's chance to learn from your colleagues and your peers. A lot of times we do happy hours at the end of ours where everyone gets together. And some of those conversations that we have are best at the happy hour. And you have to facilitate that. And that's what I think digital education really is about now is creating community around this and getting people involved and sharing it. And we're just thrill like that. We just redid our website recently. And one of the main things that we're really seeing is we list all of our like providers can list themselves as a certified running gate analyst. I got five emails last week. No joke. Like people said, thank you so much. This person found me from your wow. website and they like had a great experience and it's exactly the type of patients I want to see. So thank you. So like we have to be building education saying like, Hey, this group of people Right. You know, we don't have to all the stuff we're talking about, story brand and things like that. You also don't have to do it alone. Correct. You, you can no. join other people that are already doing that and, you know, skip some of the years of experience and, and the lost hair for me uh, <laughs> that, that led to if those of you listening to podcasts. I'm as bald as can be here. Uh, but, you know, save your hair and join communities and find people that have that those same interests so that you can learn and grow together. This is the backyard barbecue analogy that I use, which is two guys are over, you know, flipping burgers. And one guy says, one guy's a graphic designer and the other is a physical therapist. And the graphic designer is saying, Hey, my back hurts. I think it's because I'm at work all day and I'm you know, on a computer. And the physical therapist says, I could help you do that. And the graphic designer says, I'm just going to Google it and read a couple of blog episodes, you know, articles and I'm going to watch some videos. And the PT's mad. He's like, But I'm, this is, you're my ideal person. Right. And I said, that's, that's, that's a missed opportunity. I say the opposite is true. If the PT is sitting there saying, I do great work, but no one can find me. And I don't know where these patients are coming. And the graphic designer is like, I build websites and I make great, you know, graphic art. It's like, ah, I'm just going to get a Canva account and a Squarespace and I'll, I'll figure it out. It's like, both of you could have fast forwarded, saved time, effort, money, and been doing the thing you wanted to do faster if you recognize other people's strengths and superpowers. Right. It's even like I've got three young kids um, and I've got two boys and I read this great book about parenting boys and it was really not just about parenting and just about business, but they said when you're raising boys, don't expect to be everything to your kids. Okay. You can't be the only person, the only role model, and you need to get them exposed to different personality types and different people because your kids might even need to be exposed to somebody, obviously keeping them safe, uh, but that they're like, well, I don't really like Mr. So-and-so. Like, uh -huh. he, Recognize he's, why. 
Yeah, they need to be able to make those decisions for themselves, but you need to get them exposure and they need to be able to see yeah. different things um, and learn from different people. And same thing in physical therapy. Like, don't be afraid to learn from people that have business experience, graphic design experience. Right. Um, you know, go out there and, and not every article you read has to be in a PT journal. Uh, there's other professions even right. in the medical and fitness side. And then We're even in. on the business side, we need to learn and grow. Um. I'm going to ask a weird question. Go what on. gave you the right to think you could just go invent a camera system? Like <laughs> what the audacity to be like, you know what doesn't exist or it's $500,000. So it might as well not exist because it's so inaccessible. And if there only was insert the blank here that did A, B, C, D, E, I'm just going to invent it. Like who, where do you, where, who the heck do you think you are? Like yeah. walk me through that. <laughs> Right. Yeah. No, because I, I am not a software engineer. I Which might be why it, was, it worked. Right. right. Like, I'm I, like, I just like to say, sure. Yes, uh, I can do that. No problem. Um, just have the confidence to go forward. It's the same thing with patients, right? Uh, you know, right. hey, somebody walks in the door, you've never seen it before. You have to be confident that like, I'm going to figure out or I'm going to rely on other people that can. Uh, so that was that was a big thing and a, and a big motivating factor is a lot of times I think about best case, worst case. Okay. So uh, the best case scenario is that I design this camera system and there's a lot of other people like me that really want to treat athletes and they want to be known for this. And I can help other people see athletes like I want to see. And the worst case scenario is I build a system that I need for me and I build a big practice around working with runners and maybe nobody else wants it, but uh, at least I have a camera system. So the, when the worst case isn't bad, right. then you really have to say, well, why would I not do this? Like, what's the downside to doing right. it here? And, and so I looked at that best case, worst case scenario and figured, I, I bet you there's a lot of clinicians like me that are... I, I don't know the the right word to use for it, hesitant or reluctant to do some of these things if they can't really trust some of the data that they're getting. Right. And I know, and I had met some people along the way. I had great mentors, but I also encountered some people that would just watch people run and be like, I can see things when I right. run and I know what they're doing. Just like I had a friend walk into a running sh shoe store one time and it was like, do you guys do gait analysis? Because he knows that I do this. And they said, oh, I did a gait analysis on you as soon as you walk in, in, in the door. I know exactly what you're doing. And we know things like our eyes see 16 frames per second. And that's not enough to pick up on different things. That's not oh. enough to see all the different things that are happening with running. We see that it's we, there's so much that we're missing. There's, I think the term, it's been a long while since I've used this term, but I think it's called brain sponging. So your brain fills in information that it expects to see. Right. So if you think somebody's pronating, you're probably going to convince yourself that you're right. Right. And you can see that, but you're not really seeing it. And I just knew that I wanted to be able to make recommendations and really have the confidence and the clarity to say, I see this is what you're doing. I knew that I had had that in a research setting and we started to see these patterns when we were doing research of what these runners were doing. And while there's no maybe perfect way to run, what we did see is that there are really consistent patterns that we know in the literature contribute to increased stress on the body. And that if we can address those and make those loads a little more manageable, that's going to be really helpful for our runners where they don't have to be perfect. They just need to improve that 10%. Right. We didn't have that article when I first started this. Uh, but it's it's really helpful now to, to kind of back end justify a lot of it there, which is super helpful and why you got to yeah. keep up on the literature. Yeah. All right. So walk me through the 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 camera, Helix 3D, um, all of it, right? So like, what does it do? How does someone use it? What are they getting out of it? Like, it, it looks cool, but like, how do you how do you present it to someone and say, here's this thing, here's this tool Here's what you're going to be able to do with it. Here's the benefit of utilizing it. Right. So when we talk about Run DNA and kind of the elevator pitch of, of what we do, we really talk about we provide the education and technology to help people get results with runners. And that includes athletes that run too. Because if you think about it, almost every athlete runs in some capacity, you know, whether it's in training or whether it's in the sport, 
running is an essential human movement. And it's also a really highly skilled movement that people don't just naturally do. They need to train themselves how to run optimally with it. So we really, the Run DNA started in education. We did it backwards of a lot of technology companies. A lot of technology companies create a technology and then try to educate their users right. on like how to get benefit. Right. We did it backward. We were like, okay, we know what's going to benefit these runners, but we need the technology to make sure that we're applying it in the correct manner for the correct person because we had already started these courses and done that. So we think of this as an ecosystem and the technology is really just for that person that is like, I really want reliable data. I really want to make a business of this. I want to be known for this, but you know, we have 10,000 people that have taken our courses, but we don't have 10,000 camera systems out there. Right. And it doesn't have to be all related to just that. We, we see the education and the systematic approach is really helpful, which is why actually at the start of COVID, we had this essential elements course that we used to charge, I think, 150 or 200 bucks for. And we made it free at the start of COVID. And we have that free now. And we have everyone like take that, go to our website, rundna.com. There's a free course there. Get some basics, kind of get introduced to the system. We would love every PT student, every like we try to make it accessible to as many people. But the so we teach the uh, a systematic approach to working with runners and i'm a big gait analysis person but that's a piece of the puzzle we need to be looking at mobility we need to be looking at motor control strength sleep training hydration nutrition all of that stuff is an important thing to adjust with a runner right i think most people and a lot of people that work with athletes there's a critical piece of the puzzle missing because they're not doing gait analysis they are expecting like, I'm just going to make you stronger and you'll go back to running. But we know running doesn't increase strength and strengthening doesn't change your running form. So you really need to be doing both. And you can't just strengthen somebody's hip and expect them to stop having pelvic drop. If you're not providing drills and skills and gait retraining cues, you're really missing out and you're not setting that person up for success that might be uh, a recurring business model, but it's not a way to get really good results with your runners right. and your athletes. So um, the way that we set it up is that the technology incorporates all of the things that we teach in our courses. So when you set it up, it's a portable 3D motion analysis system. So it can be used in any clinical setting. You just need a flat treadmill with about four to five feet of space behind it. It had to be portable in my mind just because the clinic I was at, I didn't have dedicated lab space for this. I right. needed it to be something that I could take between multiple clinics, actually. Uh, and that was really important. So it's a three camera system. It's a marker based system. Um, we start with something called the runner readiness assessment. Like in my practice, we do a gait analysis it's like 350 bucks for a gait analysis. It's an hour and a half session. We spend half an hour talking with them. We spend about 10, 15 minutes taking them through the runner readiness where we look at their mobility and their motor control. And we teach all this in our courses. Then we put the markers on. It only takes about two or three minutes to put the markers on. The, the Marines are very proud that they can do it in under two minutes. Um, a little competitive bunch there. Um, but that you put the markers on and you get the person warmed up and you only need 10 seconds of running data. And instantly it tells you, you can even do it live. You can tell people exactly what's going on and it's going to give them what we did with the military is we took our education and we built it into an algorithm on the software so that the computer analyzes all of the different data points and gives a suggestion of where to start for what cue. Um, huh. So we have these categories, like somebody might be an overstrider cadence. That person is overstriding, so their foot lands too far in front of their body. And their cadence is low enough that we need to just start there to get their cadence high enough before we do something else with them. So somebody else might be an overstrider gluten amnesiac. And that person, maybe their cadence is good, they're still overstriding, but now they need to focus on leaning forward. And they need to get a forward lean that's going to help them to get into a proper posture and, and improve their landing mechanics. So the computer system, like I said, you only need about 10 seconds of data. And the, the nice thing about that is that that allows you to do multiple tests. 
my big thing with physical therapists is if the prof the profession would be extremely elevated if everyone would just do test retest right. every time relentlessly every patient every session do test retest and that's what we do with this system here is you do a gait analysis i tell you to increase your cadence i do another 10 second capture and we say oh look your strike from center of mass came down by five centimeters that's like a 20 percent improvement some nice feedback job. Yes. Instant feedback. Cause that's what runners lack. Runners only get that picture as they cross the race, the finish oh, line. Right, 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 know, right, right. This is right. all contorted and you know, they're sweaty and that's not, that's the most feedback that they get. Or the, or the feedback is, Hey, go try this out for a week or two. Yes. And then what did it feel? You're like, I don't know. Kind of the same. I don't yeah. like they're using, trying to use words to describe it, right. feeling. It's like, I don't know. Wonky uh different you know, stabby and you're like great that's crazy 10 seconds so yeah i mean in an in an hour or 90 minute session if you were able to, to have it you could do this oh, lots yeah. of times it's oh i use it as just regular during a treatment and i've got like 10 minutes left with somebody and i'm like hey let's just check out your running form real quick let's just out. see what it looks like um because then so also when we worked with the military we had to make it really simple because actually military police were the ones administering it um wait, wait, and military police yes they had the most time so oh. we just taught them how to put the markers on and they were like putting it on and they would just like have a treadmill set up and if they weren't doing anything then they would just put some markers on somebody they put it on and the the algorithm was built in now in the hands of a trained professional there's a lot more utility that you can use with it Correct. but we had to make it so and the benefit of that is if you're not used to using 3d it's not like on day one, you're unable to provide value with this. You, the first time you use the system, you're getting guidance. You know exactly what you need to do. And you can develop that and use your own clinical reasoning and, and figure out your own methodology too. But it's going to nudge you in the right direction. To yeah. Give you a yeah. You're saying it's giving you a place to start. Like I didn't realize that about the human eye, 16 frames per session. Yes. So like, you know, you might have approached this as a software engineer saying, all right, the eye is 16 frames per session for a second. If we can get 200, we're better. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So you're seeing more frames, but what are you doing with that? So you layered sort of an algorithm on top of this, which says, mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you the answer, but what I could do is give you a couple different places to start based right. on, based on the inputs. Here's a potential output. So it's not replacing the clinician. It's not just a faster camera it's not more frames per second it's not three angles it's cool that it's 3d but like what what am i what am i gonna be able to do with it it's cute right but what am i gonna be able to do with it giving you a place to start or things to do and i mean 10 seconds it's repeatable as you said as soon as you oh, said yeah. over and over again i thought of like i think it was episode eight which is like 1200 episodes ago with my friend john he said he was he was doing his residency. He said the same thing. He's like, if I leave everybody with one thing, it's treat, it's test, treat, retest. Please yeah. do that more. Absolutely, I wish everyone would do that. The entire profession would be elevated. We'd be, we could accelerate the growth of profession if just everyone did that. We'd be twenty years in the future, just because we're all like that's the only way you learn. That's how expertise is developed. Is you just learn all the time, a little bit every day. Um, yeah, so it's just, you just need 10 seconds of data and then you can try it again and the clinician can still really go, but we teach in the courses, Hey, if you see that overshot or knee drive, here's three different cues that you could try because it might work for one person, but not for another. And then there's guidance on that. Yeah. Um, and then with the military, we had to make it super user friendly. And this was me as a clinician too, cause I used to do gate analysis with like a video camera. And then I'd spend an hour and a half after it putting reports together and things like that. So we uh, created a web-based app. So you just hit a button on the software. It sends the report to them. Then you hit another button and it puts a like a four-week gate retraining program on their calendar. They get an email every day with videos, exercises, <laughs> drills, everything. So that when you're done, like this is from the business side, which we kind of talked about early on, when you're done a gate analysis, you don't have to do any more work. Your return on your investment is much higher because we have to value our time. And if we're spending another 45 minutes analyzing data and doing that stuff, it's much more expensive and you can't 
and even like if you're doing 2D, it's not even, you know, we're not getting the same amount of data or the same quality right. of data. So you might as well use a system that really is going to let you get the data, but also put it in a very user friendly something with format. It. Right. It's it's technology without the ability to actually inform decisions is useless in my it's opinion. Cute. Yeah, it's cute. It's 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 almost like a marketing ploy, right? You're like, oh yeah, we have 3D motion analysis. Well, what do you do with it? Right? Like, how is it going to tell you? Like, we, we had cool videos. It, we had one clinic that just switched over from a different 3D system to ours recently, and like, called me and was like, thank you so much. Like, I used to spend 45 minutes after a gate analysis going through all the numbers and the information, and now I do this in real time. Yeah. Is like my patients are loving me because you can get them. And one of my favorite things to do during a gait analysis is we get somebody on the treadmill, we have them run. I do a couple baselines. I, you know, review the numbers with them, give them a cue. They do the cue and they kind of like glance over you like, this feels different. Right. And they'll just kind of say different at first. And I'm like, okay, keep running for a little bit. And I'll say, all right, now go back to your old way. And they're like, no. Ha. Huh. I'm, I'm not doing that. Like, I don't know how I ran that way before. Right. Like, this is so different night and day. And that's just such a rewarding feeling for me. That makes all that effort and time worth it because it's like, wow, like this person. Actual change. They are. Yeah. And they identify as a runner. This is a huge part of their personality. They, I've made a significant impact on somebody's life, like right in front of my eyes. It's not four weeks later. It's like right away. We're able to do this. And then that person is like, all right, teach me how to like keep doing this here. And they're so open. I never have problems with somebody. I, I don't think I've ever done a gate analysis and somebody hasn't done the work after that. They haven't done the gate retraining program where they're like, ah, you know, it just wasn't for me. Right. Uh, right. Because you can show them immediately how it impacts the running. I can see it. I'll do it. I don't have any problems with people doing their, uh, I, the only problem I have is that they want to do too much. Right. That's a runner thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a fun way to treat, to be honest with you. I like the running nerd part is, is really where it starts is it's just, I get to nerd out about running all day and it's a great career. It's a great lifestyle. And I don't have to print this thing out and then, or put it in my own calendar every day. I show up and you show up, but you did the work two, three weeks ago. And now Every yeah. day I'm getting something either on my calendar or in my inbox. Yes. So it's just, we make it. Me. Yeah, it's easy, right? And you can print off a PDF version if you want to put it in your ED EMR system and do those kind of things or send it to a physician. But it's just with two clicks of a button, that person is going to be able to really uh, make a change. And, and that's important too, right? We want to really, we want to be that guide and we want to make sure that they understand the necessary steps to go through that transformation. And if we're not outlining it, if you're not giving them detail, like I work with a lot of professional runners and I like I've got one here. He might pop in the screen eventually. Here's coming a little bit if he pops in his head. Sorry. But, uh, you know, one of the things that they say is it, when I first started working in the pros, um, they always were really appreciative of that. I really gave full detail. I told them exactly what they needed to do and say like, yeah, we need to address your strength. We need to improve your gait. We need to do these things. If you want to work, and this is not just for running, if you want to be in any specialty practice, which I highly encourage, everyone should really try to find some niche, even if it's not 100% of what you see, try right. to find a niche that really are like your people, that ideal customer we talked about there. But, And then close the loop. Like that's what you can do is you can work hard. You can make sure you don't always have to be the smartest or, or the most well-known, but people will really appreciate if you're giving them the full attention and the comprehensive programs that they really want to say like, yes, here's what you need to do for strength. Here's what you need to do for run training. That's why like we created like a think a year and a half or two years ago, we added a coaching course to our certified running gate analyst courses because people were saying, Hey, I love working with runners, but they're always asking me about training advice. And I just, I don't know. I'm like, yeah. I, I've never trained other people for a marathon. You had to take those courses and understand like all of the elements that go into being a successful runner. This, um, you know, everything we just talked about, um, focused on your ideal person. And I feel like for for you, you were thinking about your ideal person's person, your ideal mm -hmm. person's ideal person. Yes. 
Yeah. And you're saying like, I'm here to solve your problems, but your problems are actually someone else's problems. So it's almost like that Russian doll situation where you're yeah. like, okay, but this is showing thoughtfulness and people appreciate when something, when it's designed for me, you know, I don't mind off the shelf, you know, gallon of milk. I get it. I want, right. in fact, I want the same gallon of milk as everybody else. Cause I want to make sure there's a baseline. But when you get into something like this, this is about me because this is, as you mentioned before, it's about identity. I'm a runner, but I'm like this. I'm I'm unique, right? So it sounds like the the people training, like the PTs, or the PTs mm -hmm. becoming coaches, or or just being more educated on coaching. Um, you thought about those things, and it, and you designed it for me. If I'm that ideal person, understanding that I solve those people solve other people's problems, so I need to think like them, thinking like thinking for them. So it feels like um, I, I don't know, thoughtfulness, which probably shouldn't be overlooked. We, I, I'm, you know, I think about my early career and some of the things that I think were most beneficial and helpful for me. And, you know, I did a residency program where we were putting in like 80 to hundred hour weeks and we were doing some of those things that were just, you know, really hard. And I thought about really what, what made it worth it? Like, why was I doing that? Why yeah. was I working that hard? You know, what about, and you know, we all have our internal reasons too, but there is some benefit for external validation. And when I would sure. get a runner asking for me by name, that was huge. Yeah. Right. When physicians would be like telling, all right, any runners that I have coming in, I'm going to send to you. There's a pride with that. Sure. And there's a really pride of saying like, you know, when people ask you, you're a physical therapist, like, why not say like, I'm a physical therapist for this, or I'm a running nerd, or I, you know, I think that we can specialize and focus because like you said, your backyard analogy, right? We are combating that somebody can go and Google how to do exercises for back pain. And somebody can go figure out uh, a lot of that stuff. And I even asked, like I experimented with chat GPT to like say, hey, they gave like a B minus answer for somebody with Achilles tendinopathy. So, um, you know, we're going to combat that stuff. But uh, we talked about this person, Alex. What's Alex's last name? Alex Hormozzi. Alex Hormozzi. Uh, one of his books, he had a great thing. Um, and if you're offering services, uh, one of the things I love from him is fast beats free. Okay. So if you think about your spending habits and the things that you do, a lot of times you'll make quicker impulse decisions if you think you can get somewhere faster. So if you said to that backyard person, that graphic designer, be like, yeah, but I can make you feel better within an hour. You're going to take four weeks with that. Do you want to have pain for four weeks? He might be like, no, nah, you're right. I don't want to have pain for four weeks. I got a vacation coming up. Right. But fast beats free any day of the week. there, Right. And if you think about your own spending habits, right, I like I travel a lot. I'm always on the road and I, like I like to park in short term. It's one of the few luxuries that I kind of like afford myself. I'm like when I get off that that plane, I want to be home. I don't want to have to sit and wait for a bus to come pick me up to take me like five miles away to the nearest thing. Like Fast beats free. I will spend my money on this there. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. It, it goes to like, um, I, and I've had this discussion before. People have been prompting me to do it again. There's, um, there's this thing called the 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 B to C value pyramid, business to consumer value pyramid. Yes. And what they did was they kind of created in in a pyramid form. They created the periodic table mm. of value elements. Okay. And I don't care what you offer, what you offer. The value is something you can boil it down. And like this, this big uh, consulting company, Bain and Company, designed this. Mm -hmm. And the product that was like their gold standard was the iPhone. Because mm -hmm. they said there's so many values baked into it. Yeah. You, you might be angry at the pro. Oh, I can't believe iPhones are $1,100 now. It's crazy. If you actually broke down the value, they're probably worth three grand. You know, if, if yes. you if thinking about how many times you open, use, yeah, look at, have to have that thing. Yeah. Uh, that's what. There's a spoiler. That's why Apple can charge you for whatever they're charging you for an iPhone is they they've packed it full of value. Yeah, similar to what you had said is most most might approach Run DNA and say we developed a camera now we'll teach people how to use it. You guys did it backwards. You you understood who would be using this. You said, I'm going to provide a ton of value. And this camera is also one way to deliver that value. But that's not what we do. We deliver value. A camera is just a tool. It's part of the system. It isn't the system. 
Right. The system is the value, the system right? The systematic the approach of right. how we look at runners and how we do that. That is the value that we offer. We offer confidence and clarity in working with athletes that run, right? That's, that's, that's a statement. Say that again. Yes. We offer confidence and clarity to working with athletes that run, right? And look at what, right. I yeah. would break that down and say, because you heard at runners say, I don't really know. I'm unclear. And I just sort of like, don't feel great. I feel like a little wishy-washy. Great. Say that sometimes like you can say both of those statements and they'll resonate. And it's not, some people would say that sounds like fear mongering saying I'm like, no, that's saying the quiet thing out loud. That's saying what's in their head and their heart. And it shows that you under, I mean, what did it say? Oprah said people want to uh, be seen, heard and understood. Hmm. And if you want to get someone to, to buy in, and that doesn't need to be with money. It could be with time and money. People want to know you. That's very superficial. They want to like, they need to like you. That's further down the funnel. It's a little deeper. Then and only then will they even consider potentially maybe trusting you. So it's no like trust. I mean, think of the professions who start off by saying, listen, Doug, I know we just met, but trust me, this 1989 Tercel is going to run for another 100,000 miles. Trust me. Trust me. It's a used car salesman. Yeah. Like that's their line. It's, a, it's so, it's so re- done. It's a cliche. They're trying to jump three steps and we want to do this. We push away when you're like, trust me, dude, I don't even know you. Yes. Yeah. This, this skips that. This says, listen, I understand you. Now I'm willing, if you're willing to, if you can see that I understand and like to work with people like you, I'm willing to earn your trust by showing you value. And right. that's the way to do it. Yep. And that's why our education has always been based, like you don't need technology for our education. There, like we said, there's there's ten thousand people. We don't have ten thousand camera systems out there, right? And we get emails and things all the time from just all of these clinicians that are like, "This is like such a fun way to treat, and this is so helpful." Like, thanks for helping me realize this. And there's that community out there. Yes. And because I'm, uh, I kind of operate from. I think it's called the theory of abundance. Right? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think that there's there's plenty of runners out there, right? We we joke in um, some of our marketing stuff. Everyone likes to focus on CrossFitters right now, right? And it's like, oh yeah, like work with CrossFitters, great niche, right? Well, there's four million CrossFitters uh, in the country. Guess how many runners there are, right? There's like 33 million runners. Yeah, like, like 20 10X. million of them are doing events every year. So it's like right. there's a there's a big niche with that. And I think if we can, I'm like. I'm going to give you everything I got, right? I'm going to put everything out there. I'm going to show you exactly how to do this because we're going to be able to say like, if more runners are willing and able to work with other run with other physical therapists, it's going to become common that like runners are going to trust physical therapists and we're going to create demand together. So right. there's not a limited number of people not, that we can work with. It's not cake. No. Me yeah. sending you, you know, and me, me doing good for the profession in Alabama over time will hopefully help someone who hasn't even started PT school, who's going to graduate in seven years. That's how you change culture. It isn't overnight. It isn't quick. There's no yeah. trick. It is earning and delivering on the promises that you say. Exactly. It yeah. stinks because you have to, you have to show up every day. There's no quick buck. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to ruin no, it. For you you got to work hard, but it makes it worthwhile. Totally. I mean, I think if everything, if we had hit those 10,000 people in the first like two weeks of doing it, I'd be like, oh, that's cool. And maybe, but like taking years to do it and figure out that stuff and refining the message, it. it's like, wow, that was like a really impactful number that made us just like right. pretty 10, proud of that. is not a small, I mean, I think we, I think with the internet and yeah. constant connectivity, we can often overlook how large of a number 10,000 people is. And I do this a lot with, with people that are launching podcasts. I had a guy, I won't say who it is because he's going to, he's going to blow up pretty soon. Um, but he was like, I'm stuck. He does a fantasy sports, fantasy football injury podcast. Right. Mm. And he's like, I'm getting like 250 downloads an episode. And I know like, Jimmy, you do more. And I'm like, hang on, hang on, hang on. He was in, he was in Philly and Mm. there's a bar in Philly, Chickie and Pete's. And I said, dude, imagine you set up your gear once a week at Chickie and Pete's and 250 people showed up and listened to you. Would that be a big deal? He's like, dude, that'd be huge. I go, so they are, they're just not all at Chickie and Pete's at the same time. They're doing their thing. And you, that you have access. Those people respect you enough. I said that I just tweeted this the other day. 
my podcast is free, but it's not because you have to give me 45 minutes of your time and at least most of your concentration. I can listen to podcasts while I'm making eggs and stuff. It's kind of why I like podcasts is I kind of mm -hmm. can kind of zone in and zone out. But that's value. 10,000 people showing up, that's not a small number. Right. But I mean, I like your perspective of that. Like put all those people, if we had done one seminar and 10,000 people showed up, it'd be like, we need a pretty big venue for that, right? right? And what gets me excited is that like, when we get those emails from those people telling us that like, we have this big sale going on in our education right now. And like a lot of people are saying, hey, they're promoting it for us, right? Yeah. They're putting it out there. Like these courses have made such a big difference. I'm signing my colleague up. I'm doing that. I'm like, that's awesome. And that's like, that's what we're just here for is we just want to help other people. And I'm going to give you it all. Like, let right. me know what you want. Like, I'll give it to you because I think we can do better together than we can alone. You don't buy, you can't buy that. People try to buy virility. And what, vi yeah. what viralness is, is someone seeing what you're doing, appreciating enough to then do the thing you can't buy, which is using, using that relationship they've built and telling a friend yeah. That's why one of the lines that we use is like, listen, the podcast is free. It's it, of course, cost your time. If you like, if you like us, tell, tell one friend and we will consider this a great relationship. And yeah. that's great. You have to put the value in on the beginning to ever even be able to ask for that with a straight face. You can't just say, Hey, just trust me and tell a friend like, right. no, that's shady again. Um, that's, we, yeah. when we do this marketing course that we do for it, one of the first lesson is, is giving value. Right. And you have to give a ton of value before you can ever expect to receive some in return. Yeah. And don't like use that theory of abundance. There, there is plenty out there. And you are like, I think part of that is also have the confidence to know that you have just, value. You have value. And sharing a little bit of value is not all the value that you have. Like people still want to see that. And not everyone's going to come in, not everyone's going to be a customer, not everyone's going to take our courses. That's absolutely fine. We want to, to find those ideal people that want to treat runners that want to do this the right way. And then that can be a really rewarding, fulfilling career. And that's what we want everyone to find. We haven't talked about P value, but I'm about to say, I'm about to use bell curve. Ready for oh, this? There you go. I talk to people all the time about this. They, I work with organizations that create content sometimes and I'll say, listen, I need you to give away a preview because me, us telling someone how great your thing is. Listen, I've read your thing. It is in fact great. And should you get, people to write reviews for you. Absolutely. We are now in an age where information is so easy to access that and, and come by, right? Like you said, chat mm -hmm. GPT or, or Google, that it isn't necessarily the information. It also is how you present it. Like if yes. I were, you know, you could, you could take a book that you've written, put it into, you know, 500 little blog posts or social media pieces of content, give it away. And you'll still find people willing to come and give you money because you provided value. That bell curve analysis, listen, on the left side of the bell curve, you're going to get cheapskates who are going to show up, mm -hmm. take the free, and never, ever, ever purchase. And that's okay. Just don't be annoyed by them. You you're still also helped them. Help, help, yeah. Great. You helped them, and they got value, or they didn't, and you weren't. they weren't your right people. Far right of the bell curve, they were going to give you the money anyway because they had an experience, and you needed to do nothing. You over, You gave them abundance, and they're like, done. I see run DNA. I show up. I'm like, man, but what do we know about the middle of the bell curve? It's big. Huge. It's the biggest part, right? I'd rather talk to those people, over-serve them, and this thing lets us do it at scale. Look what right. we're doing right now. We're having an hour-long conversation. One day, we share this, and it spreads. And now people are like, okay. So maybe in you know, 58 minutes ago, no one knew Doug. They didn't hear Run DNA. But now they're like, okay, I know him. I kind of sound like I like him. He sounds passionate. Sounds like he knows what he's talking about. They go and do one thing. They take that course you just mentioned for free. And they're like, shoot, I kind of like this. Someone could have gone from no like trust with one podcast episode yeah. and one course. And now they're like, this is the thing. You saw me and you created the thing that solved my problem. I will appreciate you. And it's simple, but not easy, right? There's, I mean, Doug had to earn that information the, the he had to lose the hair right he had to put the hours in to lose the hair to be able to get that so i'd say like it's simple because we're looking at it 16 miles down the road from when you started doing this mm -hmm. it's simple not easy um but man if you like the if you like the journey how much fun is i mean this is a legit question for you doug how much fun yeah. has it been 
No, oh, this is great. I I can't believe that this is what I get to do, right? Like this is my career because people think like, oh, you're like a physical therapist. Like, why do you travel all the time? Like, what? Like, I'm about to go over to Switzerland for a high altitude training camp for wow. like a week and a half. Like, I never thought my PT career would take me these kind of places or that I, you know, I early on in my career, I tried to think about defining success. Right. And I thought about, all right, the number of people that I help. And pretty quickly, I started to realize like, well, I, you know, the average PT sees around four to 500 unique people a year. That's a lot of people over a lifetime. And that's, that's definitely not something to frown upon. Right. But I was like, hey, if I start teaching these courses, if I have those 10,000 people, if they each see 400 people a year, and this content helps them do better. My reach is much farther. Mm. And a lot of physical therapists like myself get in this because we want to help. We want to be, we want to contribute. We want to help. It, it makes us feel good to help other people. And I'm just grateful that that's what I get to do for a career. So I'm, I'm thrilled to do this. And it, it is a lot of hard work and it's, it's, you know, taken, you say, you know, 16 miles down the road, you know, it, it feels like each one of those was like, carrying a 50 pound pack, uh, you know, each step, but it's fun and yeah. it's, it's great to see it. And you have to celebrate the little victories along the way, but I just know that there's so much more that we can do. And I'm just appreciative to everyone that joins us along that journey. Yeah. Uh, when someone goes to run DNA.com, if you know, specifically our audience is, is physical therapists, physical therapists, assistants, students, what are they going to find there? You mentioned some of the resources, but like, give them like the quick and dirty, like what are they going to find when they go there in terms of like, what can they learn? What can they become? Now we're talking like Donald Miller. Yeah, there you go. Right. So um, at the top of the page, there's the free course. This is going to give an intro, you know, especially the students, or if you need a little refresher on biomechanics, um, there's a good refresher and it introduces our five running gate categories in that course and kind of talks a little bit about the whole ecosystem. So if you want to learn more and kind of see, you know, it's a very evidence-based approach, very scientific, but proven now, um, you know, throughout a lot of different avenues. So go there, but then go to the resources and we put a ton of content out on the resources um, you know, why get a gate analysis blog, like share that content. We, we tried to create content that our users, our education users, our 3D device users, that they can share to educate their communities too and say, hey, why should you get a gate analysis? Or why should every runner be doing heavy strength training? Why should they be doing these things? And so there's a bunch of blogs and content. We're doing a summer webinar series um, I think we've got another one coming up in July about uh, BFR for runners. I know that's a big topic. Yep. One of our instructors, Scott Greenberg, is, is doing that for us. It's going to be really interesting. So, uh, But find the free course, and then there's more info about the, the certified running gate analyst courses if you go to the education tab or find out about the Helix 3D tab um, and some of the programs we've, we've uh, seen a big uptick with that. We're offering some new programs around the Helix 3D um, that has been a little bit more, if I had more hair, I'd, I'd lose it just because we, we ran out of inventory recently, but that's a good problem to have. <laughs> good problem to have. The sites coming on and, and it's, it's pretty exciting times here. So that's cool. Uh, Doug, we have a tradition on the show. It's called three questions. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, yeah let's go, go for it. it. Three questions. Uh, question one uh, as a runner myself and you as a runner, sometimes we need to, to zone out. So do you listen to music while you run? I listen to a lot of podcasts and audio books. Okay. I'm a big See, audio ask, book it, my question was going to be music or, or words. So audio books and podcasts while you run. Yeah. On like 1.2 to 1.3 speed. Cause it, really? it, that helps me to pay attention more when somebody talks like a little quick demo. If I tart, start to talk really slow, right. people zone out. But if you talk really fast, then they start to really pay attention right. to what you're doing. Um, so I put uh, podcasts and audiobooks on like 1.3 speed and I listen to those while I run and it's huh. a good like good time for me. But I only I don't do that often. Um, I would say like 25% of the time I listen to something. Most of the time I just, I give myself my first mile to think about any problem that I have or things that I'm thinking about. And I say, if I can't solve it in the first mile, I, I'm not going to figure it out. So I'm just going to enjoy the rest of the run. Got it. Okay. 
Um, hi, you know, you know, the, the show is, uh, you know, sort of based around having a pint. So we'll talk about drinking something. What's your, what are your go-to, uh, sort of running drinks pre post? What's your, what are your hydration things? I mean, you know, besides water. Yes. Um, I have been doing a lot of, uh, like electrolyte drinks recently, especially in the summer We're recording this in the summer. If I do a long run and 90 minutes, I use either like a liquid IV or an element, um, and I have one of those after, and that makes a big difference. Sometimes if I don't, I get a headache um, just from hydration. So those hydration multipliers, as they say, can can be really helpful. So a lot of times I'll, I'll grab one of those after, uh, and that makes a, a, a pretty big difference in my hydration status. But yeah, a lot okay. of water too. Third question will be a who question. Uh, earlier we mentioned, uh, you mentioned Irene Davis, Rich Willie. We've had, we were lucky enough to have both of those people on the show. Who is someone the audience should know more about that maybe isn't Irene Davis or Rich Willie or someone who does great work could be in or out of the profession. Doesn't matter. Just someone that you're like, this person is really insightful. Mm. Can I give one in and one out maybe? Do it. Yeah. Like yeah. So um, in the profession, one of our instructors, Scott Greenberg is great wealth of knowledge on a lot of those things. He's uh, been at UF for a long time, worked with a ton of athletes, does a lot of things there. So um, Scott's a great one that, you know, there's some small circles with that uh, in the running community. And Scott's definitely in that. He was a former SIG chair for um, the running SIG in the sports section. So that and then I'm uh, not somebody I know personally, but outside of the profession, I'm a huge James Clear fan. Oh, yeah. Atomic yeah, Habits. Yeah, like Atomic Habits. Um, I think that there's a lot of value there. And there's a couple really good podcasts he's on since this is yeah. a podcast group. Tim Ferriss's interview of James Clear was a fantastic one. And okay. Brene Brown did a two-part with uh, James Clear. That's a good way to get introduced with them. So those are uh, two people I would follow if you're interested in running and just in general content. Maybe I'll change the question because I do ask that who question a lot, but... I do like when people shine a light on people in our profession. That's cool. It's a great way to give a nod to someone you respect and, and you work with. But we also, from my opinion, we need to be saying this person who is in a completely unrelated field, but I get value from this. So that's yes. the person I think you should bring it in because they'll bring you new perspective and new ideas. Maybe I'll twist that question from now on. Mm. All right. Hey, I feel great. I, maybe I influence the future podcast here. So thanks. That makes me All feel right. good. Last thing we do on the show, Doug, is called The Parting Shot. All right. Parting Shot, just your last chance for a mic drop moment. Well, maybe we'll call it like the last mile. We got Doug on. He'll make mm. everything running, running related, running specific. So just an idea, concept. You can reiterate something you've already said. Doesn't matter. What's what's the what's something you'd want to leave with the audience as we wrap up today? I would say the best thing to do is just to get started. Um, if you're looking to start working with a profession, like a niche inside the profession, if you're looking to do this, you might not be interested in running. You might be interested, but don't stop. Don't delay. Just get started and working on it and find that community that we talked about. I think we really had some good conversations here about really just finding like somebody's probably created a course or somebody's got a community or a podcast that's talking about these things. So find your tribe and like join up with them and really just see if you can grow together. Um, because I think that I, I have to say, I, like, I'm just so grateful for my mentors along the way that have really helped me. And if you don't have a mentor, if you don't have somebody that you're following their content and be willing to like sign up for whatever they put out, like find that person, um, and start creating it and maybe see if you can give back as well. If you're in a position where you've, you've created some of that, see if you can give back too. Cause I think our profession needs that. I love the fact that like a guy who went and created like this camera system, algorithm, all sorts of analysis, your parting shot is people, which is the beginning and end. Like if you have a problem, however, however complicated it seems, even if it's about algorithms and AI, the answer is probably people like mm -hmm. find the people. They'll be the path. The solution might feel techy, but my, my guess is from what you're saying, what I'm taking is like we begin and end with people. Exactly. Yeah. It's, I don't want to sell a camera system to somebody that's not going to use it. Like I'm not a salesman. I'm a clinician. Like we, we want to bring people together that are really interested in elevating the profession and are getting the message out there that gate analysis is a critical component. 
And, you know, like that or not, like, you know, th that's not going to hurt me, right? I, it's not going to hurt my feelings. Like, uh, you know, I, I just want to help as many people as we can. And I think whether you want to work with runners or not, you just need that kind of environment that's going to help you to grow and learn. Um, because it's just, it, it's more fun. And we only get so many laps around the sun. You got to enjoy what you're doing. Love it. Uh, RunDNA.com. I expect to see some sort of Run DNA, Run DMC logo T-shirt somewhere at some point. If it isn't already, I know I'll, I'll sign up for that. That'd be cool. Nice. We'll get that uh, on the printer there. We'll we get designed that a Run DPT, and I like totally like did the spoof on the Run DMC logo with Run DPT, and I was like, this feels, this is right there. So that That's awesome. that was the first thing I thought of when I when I saw the website. I was like, Run DNA, Run DMC, Run DPT. Got it. Um, would love to have you back on the show sometime soon, Doug. Uh, learned a lot, and thanks for doing what you do. Thanks for doing what you do, Jerry. This is great. I mean, you're connecting that community. This is part of like helping those people find the communities. I really appreciate it. I know I've listened to your podcast, you know, uh, more times than I can count, uh, and really enjoyed it. So, um, thanks for for doing this, and thanks for having me, and and always willing to be on and, and have a good conversation. Thanks so much. All right, so let's say the best conversations happen at Howard. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's do it again. The best conversations happen at happy hour. Thanks for coming to ours. Like what you hear? Tell a friend or leave a review on iTunes or Google Play. The show today is brought to you by the Brooks Institute of Higher Learning, an innovator in providing advanced, post-professional education. The Brooks IHL offers seven on-site PT residencies, including orthopedics, women's health, geriatrics, pediatrics, sports, and neurology, as well as a neurologic OT fellowship, a competitive OMPT fellowship, and a speech therapy clinical fellowship. Therapists that complete a residency or fellowship through the Brooks IHL will markedly advance their knowledge and skills in a specialty area of practice. Learn more about how a residency or fellowship can help you advance your professional development at brooksihl.org. Our home on the internet. PTPinecast.com. Created by Build PT. Build PT provides marketing services specifically for private practice PTs. From website development and hosting. Providing content marketing solutions for PT clinics across the country. See what Build PT can do for you today at BuildPT.com. The PT Pinecast is a product of PT Pinecast LLC. It is hosted and produced by PT Pinecast CEO Jim McKay and CBO Sky Donovan from Marymount University. We talk PT, drink beer, and record it. This has been another pour from the PT Pinecast. The PT Pinecast is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can be present. More on the show at ptpinecast.com. 